Now the transition to the following sections after he uh, Sutton has exposed the problem with these two models, uh, two examples. Um, in section four to seven, Sutton discusses four possibilities taken from the literature, what the function of abstract models in economics could be. He confronts <coughs> these possibilities with what Akerlof and Schelling actually write. He's looking very carefully, very surprising for an economist, that he looks so carefully what exactly do they say in their papers and concludes that neither of these possibilities does justice to the papers. So you have, you have a, a sort of interpretation, what they're doing, and then, then you say, well, Akerlof and Schelling, they knew what they were doing, so uh, how do they describe the use of these models? And you compare that what the philosophers or other people are saying, say, well, no fit. No, that can't be, can't be the full story. Okay. And then in section 8, Sutton presents his own solution, induction, and um, he thinks that induction has to be justified, and two common approaches do not work, sections 9 and uh, 10, and then his own solution for the justification of inductions in section uh, 11. So this is really a well-composed uh, paper. This is wonderful. You know exactly what's going on, and you know what he's doing, and you know what the arguments are, and he's taking seriously other, paper, other people and other papers. Uh, so this is a, a well-composed paper. Well, good scientists write good papers. <clears throat> so the first um, possibility that Sutton discussed is, was proposed by Horsman. We know him already um, in some sense. As a philosopher, he claims that theoretical work in economics is often more concerned with conceptual exploration rather than empirical theorizing. So he says the, uh, this is fine that uh, these people here, like Akerlof or Schelling, what they are doing and not trying to um, show us testable hypotheses that follow from these uh, assumptions there. Uh, but what they are really doing is conceptual exploration exploration, meaning to analyze how, the con how do the concepts hang together that are there used and what are the consequences of certain concepts. So you're just analyzing the concepts and analyze the conceptual content of the model. And of course, this is also necessary whenever you, you write a, a model or a theory, you're going to be clear, more or less clear about what, what do the concepts mean there, and you may illustrate them, possibly even define them, how they're connected and so on. And he thinks, uh, that Horsman thinks, that uh, this is the main work they are doing, they are just conceptually explore what's in this idea of weak racial preferences and their consequences. Now, what uh, Sutton says against that, he objects that this does not really fit the fact that the models are supposed to provide some kind of explanation, however sketchy and imperfect. And Sutton says, wait a minute, I don't understand. How could a uh, conceptual exploration, where you just look, you know, how do the concepts interlock, what do they mean, and so on, how can that provide the means to give an expl explanation for an empirical phenomenon? How should that go? Right? You may think about what are singles today and what's the difference between single and not married. Uh, and you may you know, think about that. Fine, then you get some clarity about these concepts. But that doesn't give you any means to explain why, say, in Zurich are more than 50 people live in single households, for instance. Right? Nothing. That's an empirical fact. You don't get that empirical stuff out of conceptual considerations. The conceptual considerations give you some clarity of what you are talking about, but they don't give you anything about empirical facts. So this is what Sutton says. That can't be the true story. <clears throat> um, in both papers, real-world phenomena are discussed, with clearly transcends a discussion of the internal logic of the models. And this is a very, very plausible objection. And he says, look, this method of just discussing what's in the model uh, doesn't give you predictions for, for what's in the real world. It just tells you how you should use and should not use the concepts, but it doesn't explain anything in the real world. You can't do that. So he rejects that very, very plausibly. The next thing is instrumentalism. Well, um, there he says, if the models could be understood as parts of instrumentalism, they would only be used for predictions. Now here you see um, the way Sutton speaks, and, and most people do that, they do not make the difference between the local and the global forms of instrumentalism, or the local and global forms that I discussed um, wherever, I think, yeah, with, uh, with Friedman. That's very important. What they mean is, of course, not instrumentalism and wholesale, global, 
but that you make of the model only an instrumentalist use. Right? You only use it as an instrument that has nothing to do with your overall philosophy of economics or whatever. Anyway, so the point is, uh, one theory one could have here, or, or, yeah, or a point of view, is that models in economics are used as instruments, and you're only interested in their predictive power and not in, in anything else. They would only use for predictions. And this is simply not the case. This is what, uh, if you read the papers, they are not just uh, used, they describe a connection between real causes and real effects. Right? So in the, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, paper on, on segregation, I mean, it's weak racial preferences, and they have an effect on how some American cities are built up, you know, with strong segregation. So this is not just an instrument for predictions, no. Uh, it's real causes and real effects, and thus they do not belong to instrumentalism, but to realism. Again, this is how Sutton describes it. Um, they should be seen as trying to uh, get at real causes, causes in the real world. And that is not something that an instrumentalist or an instrumentalist use of a model does. So instrumentalism doesn't work, and Sutton is probably right here. The next one is that people say, well, these models that we're using, these very abstract models, they are metaphors, right? So metaphors or caricatures of the reality. <coughs> um, some authors describe the fit of the model to the real world. Oh, misprint here, real world. It should be as casual. So, you know, it, it's very, very light. And uh, the, the question is then, uh, how does this mode of explanation work? If you say a model is really a metaphor or a caricature, you may say, yeah, perhaps, but then explain to me how does a caricature really explain something in the real world? How should that go? That's, that's not an answer to my question, because my question was I want to understand how these explain. Now, one answer, models are metaphors. Well, the answer is itself a model, uh, a metaphor. How does it work? So if you say a model is a metaphor, you may say, yeah, that may be true, but my question was not what's the nature of the model. My question was, how does a model explain? And by saying it's a metaphor, you don't get an answer that it explains. I mean, do we understand how metaphors explain? Well, some people claim that they do. Anyway, but anyway, it's, it's, it's not an obvious explanation then. Another answer is models are caricatures. Um, how, do the, how are the distortions involved in caricatures explanatory? Right? I mean, caricatures make uh, exaggerations and abstractions and idealization and all sort of stuff, uh, also uh, substitutions. But the question is then, uh, how, how do they produce the explanatory power that models seem to have in economics? <coughs> So this doesn't seem to work. And finally, economics as an inexact deductive science and the method of isolation. Um, this is similar ideas that we find in Daniel Horsman and Uskalimeki. They are the, from the older generation. They're the most inf influential uh, now um, philosophers of e economics. Horsman says models are inexact generalizations with implicit ceteris paribus clauses and only a few causal factors are taken into account and others set constant. That doesn't sound implausible, but the point is, do we get an explanation for the explanatory power of models? That's another thing. Mackey says, economics uses the method of isolation. Some factors are isolated from others as relevant. Models become thought experiments. Well, this is also a larger, rather large step that uh, some factors are isolated from others, and therefore the models becoming thought experiments. Well, that's a step. I'll come back to that when I talk about experimental economics in section 8 or whatever. Um, then we talk about the difference between thought experiments and other kinds of experiments. Um, anyway, so um, Sutton's objection is this does not play plausible why the model should be credible for the real world. Right? The, the, you, you may say, yes, this is all fine, this, these descriptions with inexact generalizations and isolations and whatnot, but the point is... Why does that not impair the, the credibility of a model for an explanation in the real world? If you want to understand how these models work, you should understand that, and this is not what we are getting. And he's right in insisting on that, because um, 
uh, it's not only that the, so to speak, true element of a model are interesting, but also the untrue elements are interesting. So why don't do there any harm in a model? How come? Right? You've got to, got to have some sort of story how that works. <coughs> and uh, this is then um, uh, his problem. He needs uh, 19 pages really to fully um, um, develop that. Somehow a transition has to be made from a particular hypothesis, which has been shown to be true in the model world, to a general hypothesis, which we can expect to be true in the real world too. So you have some, you can say some true things about the model world, right? About these chips on the chessboard. You can say true things, what is happening there, fine. But the question is, how does that help me understand what's happening in the real world, right? Even if that stuff is true in the model world. And there he's, lab, uh, he, he's working on it and says, look, there is a deep gap, and I want to understand how that gap can be bridged. <coughs> and uh, this is now when he comes to his um, um, way of then developing uh, his own answer. He said inductive inference is here uh, a fantastic, uh, uh, is here uh, involved. A causal factor that F, a causal factor F, F for factor, explains irregularity R in the model world. Therefore, it's credible that F also explains R in the real world. And similar for prediction. So he says, you know, if you see the working of the factor F in the model world, that it's got an explanatory force in the model world for the model of uh, irregularity R, then we may somehow transfer that from the model world to the real world, and then it's credible that also in the real world this factor has the same effect. So you get somehow a connection in the model world, and you can transfer that to the real world. And you say, yeah, um, what shall I say? Yeah, um, perhaps, well, when you hear that in that way. Anyway. But it involves an inductive step, namely if you uh, f uh, go from a specific situation, namely from the specific situation in the model world, you somehow go to a more general one about uh, the real world as well. So this is, uh, a, in a sense, it's an inductive step, and the question is, is that step justified? So um, um, Sarkton is aware that induction is a problem, and um, induction should be justified, and we can't really justify it. Uh, so he sees, wait a minute, here's an inductive step, and we should be a little careful here, and uh, this doesn't really work. And then he, he says that there are several uh, possible answers for that, justifying induction by separability, and that he, may, um, he refers to an argument that's based on Mill's account of causation. That's the same Stuart, John Stuart Mill, whom you know as an economist and a moral philosopher, a very important guy from the 19th century. And uh, there the separability of causes and their vector addition would justify a transfer of causal relations in model to the real world, and that question mark is mine because I simply don't understand the argument. I don't know how that should go, why this is relevant. I just don't understand it. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, Sutton dislikes it. Um, I don't know whether I dislike it or not because I don't understand it. Um, well, I could dislike it because of that. Anyway, but I didn't go into the literature, so I can't explain to you how, how this is meant. I just don't understand it. Sutton finds the argument inadequate, uh, and therefore he says, well, that, that's, that's no way to go. So here's another attempt, uh, so-called robustness, and that's, of course, something uh, all who, everyone who works with models knows that robustness is a fundamental uh, ingredient of, of uh, working with model. You have, must have some sort of robustness. Uh, the results derived from a model are robust, and that means to changes in the specification of that model. So you may play around with certain parameters, and the main results of the model must be stable against that. That's robustness. right? You play around with stuff that's supposed to be inessential, you play around with that, and the, the result, what the model does, should, be in a, should not be affected. So that's robustness analysis. The question is, of course, uh, every modeler knows that and does it. The question is, what is exactly robustness analysis doing for you? Why are you using it, and what is exactly the effect? And there are really d d d d disagreements uh, about that, uh, also in philosophy of science, um, and it's not, quite, it's not so easy to see what robustness uh, analysis is really doing. Um, at least uh, it induces, as um, Sakten puts it, um, uh, that it induces the expectation that the results of the model 
could also be derived from a wide class of models, showing the unimportance of their specificities. That's, that's plausible, right? When you play around with, with some of the parameters, say you have the 8 times 8 um, uh, uh, checkerboard, right? And, and the, the one I showed you in the other, other one was, I think, uh, 30 times 30 or something, or 20 times 20. And then you say, oh, the result of this segregation should be independent of the dimension of the checkerboard. Right? If, if the checkerboard is only 2 times 2, it doesn't work, of course. But say from 8 times, it should be independent whether it's then 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 times 70. So that's a parameter where you said that should be independent. If it's, not, if it's dependent, strongly dependent of the dimension of the checkerboard, something is wrong. Uh, somehow it's not useful. So this is really, really plausible um, that some of the specificities are unimportant but showing that this, uh, it, the checkerboard model is independent of the dimension of the checkerboard doesn't tell you that it's also independent that this is just a checkerboard and the real city is something like Boston where you do have uh, racial segregation. Right? So it has something to say, but the question is what exactly does this um, um, uh, robustness analysis help us? Does the robustness analysis make the model itself more plausible? Right? Without further empirical checks, some people believe so. Well, other people say it can't be because you're staying in the model world and reality is out here and you're constructing something here and all the properties you can construct can't tell you anything about the real world. So why is that robustness um, analysis so important? Um, yeah, uh, this is what I said. This kind of robustness concerns the world of models, but it is far from clear that the model results can be extrapolated to the real world. I mean, somehow one, one feels, if, if you don't think too much, then you say, yeah, this robustness is wonderful. Yeah, I probably can use it for explanation, but when you think about it, wait a minute, you learn something about the model world. You didn't learn anything about the real world, but somehow you get the feeling, Oh, yes, because it's so robust, I can apply it there too. But when you ask, what sort of logic is that? What's the argument that this is possible? Say, that's unclear, right? So th this is typical for these situations where then methodologists uh, enter the scene. <clears throat> what would make this inductive stuff, the general, uh, generalization of model results to the world, to the real world, credible? I mean, what is the argument that this robustness, this uh, successful robustness analysis, makes uh, the result from the model world credible as applicable and re in the real world? How does that work? And he's right in putting his finger uh, on this problem. <clears throat> now, he is going to give, uh, I think I, I finished this uh, presentation here before the break. Um, he's now saying, I'm going to do, uh, use another way, justifying induction by credible world. So he said, these two ways how people try to justify the induction, he thinks it's an inductive step anyway, from the model world to the real world, it's an inductive step, and, but it has to be justified. He thinks that the, this has, he, he learned from, you know, Hume saying induction is a problem, you've got to justify it somehow. Um, and uh, th there he says, uh, I've got my own story. And uh, he says, uh, if, we are make, if we are to make inductive inferences from the world of a model to the real world, we must recognize some significant similarity between those two worlds. So he says the main point, if you make such an inductive inference from here to there, that can only be possible or justified if you have significant similarities between these two worlds. They build, so to speak, the bridge between these two worlds. And only if you have these significant similarities, then you are allowed to make an inductive step from one to the other. So that doesn't sound implausible. And uh, here it, uh, he says what these significant similarities are on page 24. Since the same effects are found in both real and imaginary cities, it is at least credible to suppose that the same causes are responsible. Right? So you find the same effect, namely segregation, and then you say, well, uh, I can understand the cause in the model world, namely weak um, uh, racial preferences, and that makes at least credible that the same causes 
are responsible in the real world. And this is probably how we reason, right? When we, when we say that, I mean, when, when I told you that about, say, the restaurants and uh, men and women, how they sit and so on, and, and you said, yeah, I know that, yeah, and, and that why, yeah, but, yeah it, there, there's that sort of similarity, you know, between the checkerboard example and the real example and, and the real world stuff. So there is a significant similarity, as he puts it, and because of that significant similarity, we are allowed to transfer the insights from the model to the real world. This is what he says. And this is this credibility. This is in the, type, in, in the paper, Credible Worlds. Right? Thus, the inductive inference is made credible by the same causality in the model world and the real world. Right? Because this sameness of the causality produces a significant similarity between the two worlds. So he says inductive steps presuppose a significant similarity. What is the significant similarity here? Well, it's the same sort of causality. Both in the model world, right? Uh, mild preferences as exemplified um, more than two neighbors, same color, right? And then you move away, uh, uh, th then you stay, or less than you move away. And that's similar to what can happen in the real world, you know, with people with different skin color and then uh, staying or moving away. So it says it's the same causality that's there, and that allows us to make that inductive step from the model world and to have it, uh, the credibility of the model world to, to uh, transfer this credibility uh, to the real world. And um, that doesn't sound stupid. I mean, that sounds quite good, doesn't it? I mean, it's... Um, yeah, could be, yeah. I mean, don't we reason that way? All right. So that's, and therefore, credible worlds, that's in the, t in the title. And then uh, he comes to the conclusion. The usefulness of abstract uh, economic models depends on inductive inferences from the world of models to the real world. Why inductive? Well, it's a sort of generalization, right? You generalize from the world of models then to the, to the real world. Uh, you generalize there as you do when you have seen 10 well, 10 pieces of copper that uh, lead electricity, um, and then you, you transfer that to the next, and, and you generalize. Uh, so this is how it works. Depends on inductive inferences from the world of models to the real world. Models describe, and this is how he summarizes it then, describe credible counterfactual worlds. This credibility gives us some warrant for making inductive inferences from model to real world. Gives us some warrant. Okay. Um, all right, so this is Sugden, and um, uh, uh, he was critically discussing the literature before him and then making an, uh, a proposal himself that was then discussed, and we are going to discuss that critically.